The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. So we've had a mix of lectures in terms of uh, focusing on specific topics and the details of models with notation. Sometimes that's coupled with an overview of the literature to put the paper in context. Uh, sometimes, and today will be an example, we're just going to try to do one thing and, and do it reasonably well, although there is a lot of material today. Um, There are other things that were listed on the reading list. Uh, Cynthia Kinnon's job market paper, for example. As we go through this, I'll point out what she was doing uh, and how that compares to what we're doing today. I deliberately decided not to go through her paper on the front end of this because it just chews up more time. And, you know, and there's been like that macro lecture and maybe the labor lecture was filled a lot of material and I'm sort of in the mood of doing a, a smaller thing well today rather than trying to cover too much. So there is a background, though, and that is constraints. We've been talking about constraints all semester. Uh, consumption smoothing literature, including not just full insurance, but you know permanent income, buffer stock, those we did, these sort of standard incomplete markets literature. There's private information stuff. We have mentioned it in class from time to time, not done too much explicitly, although the Ben Mole paper and the others that lecture were macro models based on assumptions about information structures. Uh, limited commitment, we've actually done quite a lot, not just how it affects consumption, but, but also in those macro models. So anyway, there's a consumption literature out there. There's a bunch of investment literature out there, which includes adjustment costs, sensitivity of investment to cash flow, structural modeling, and just outright reduced form empirical papers. Um, uh, and I've already mentioned some of this sort of macro literature with incomplete markets. Some of these papers we covered in class, not all of them. Uh, and finally, we get to this, which is small but growing literature uh, trying to test across different models. Most of the above pick one thing to do and try to do it really well. Some compare across maybe two models, and uh, some even more than two. So, you know, this, I could probably add two or three more references. There just isn't that much out there that systematically are agnostic about what the underlying constraint is and set out to discover the best fit against the data and hence what the obstacles really are. Um, so the point is we're not going to just look at investment, not just look at consumption. Largely, we will look at both together. We're not going to look at just incomplete markets or endogenous information constrained markets. We're going to test for them both classes within and across um, and talk about how to do it and what kind of data we need. Um, the tools, we're solving these dynamic models. Uh, we can allow any number of financial information regimes. Uh, we're going to use maximum likelihood to estimate the parameters, uh, which allows us to be more general in a couple of ways. First of all, we can back out all the structural parameters, not just the parameters that are in a particular Euler equation. Um, and likewise, we can have more than one equation, so to speak. We can look not only at consumption Euler equations, but investment rate of return equations. Again, I think, you know, in my mind at least, these are familiar themes that 
we've been sort of covering in bits and pieces in each of the various lectures. Um, what was Cynthia doing in her job market paper? She was looking at uh, various financial information regimes, but focusing on the Euler equations. You know, and as you go from like full risk sharing to limited information about output to um, moral hazard, constrained insurance, the form of the Euler equation varied from one to the other, including what variables should or should not show up as lags. And, uh, and, and the basis of her test was to see whether, you know, lagged inverse marginal utility was a sufficient statistic. Um, I'll say more about that as we go through. Um, so there's a long list of regimes. I think part of the point of this is that the technology is available to test almost any regime subject to computational constraints. So under incomplete markets, we could have autarky, which is the worst, savings only, as in buffer stock, you know, maybe borrowing up to a limit. We've talked about that in the sort of the natural borrowing limit and other limits, and then, you know, a single risk-free asset, which is like permanent income, unlimited borrowing and lending. And then we have these sort of endogenously determined incomplete regimes, namely moral hazard, limited commitment, hidden output, unobserved investment, uh, and the least constrained regime, the, the full information regime. So there's six or seven of them here. Um, and we're going to go through tools that allow you to test one against the other pairwise for any, any pair depending on what data you want to use. So there's uh, a mechanism design contract theory part, which we've been putting off until today, largely. There's dynamic programming as in value functions. We have been seeing versions of that through various of the lectures. Uh, there's linear programming. I'm going to say why momentarily, although we were already starting to do that when we did Rogerson's paper on labor supply. And although it was probably hard to figure it out, that's what Victor Zorn was doing in a TA session last Thursday. Uh, and, uh, and maximum likelihood, which sounds familiar anyway. Uh, so we compute, we estimate, and we test, basically. We can do it on actual data. I'm going to focus on the contrast between the urban data and the rural data. We can actually use it on simulated data. So I, you know, I vote for this technique which is, you know, generate the data from the model itself. You, then you know for sure what's generating the data and see whether you kind of get back what you put in in terms of the financial regime and the, and the underlying parameters. Uh, and the results are reassuring, subject to, to measurement error. Um, I mean, one comment, but you have to be patient to get to the sort of get through the next 45 minutes or so, the criticism of maximum likelihood is it's kind of black boxy. You don't really know other than trying to fit histograms. Uh, you know, it's not like you're focusing on ROA and how it varies with wealth or transitions in the capital stock. So, or for that matter, the time series that the model is generating. But I'll come back at the end and show you the pictures of the actual data, and you'll, you'll get, you've seen it actually, but I'll remind you parts of it, and you'll see why, what it is that makes it difficult for some of these financial regimes to fit the data, and hence what the obstacles seem to be out there. We use the tie data because we have both the consumption and the asset and income data. Uh, and, uh, and using both is helpful, but that doesn't mean these techniques are limited to rather special databases. Mostly if you have surveys of firms, they would not ask about the consumption of the owner. Fortunately, the reverse is 
not so is less constraining, which is household level surveys done by you know the World Bank, Living Standards Measurement, and the life you know FLS uh, Family Life Cycle in Mexico and Indonesia and so on. They do typically ask the household a lot about their enterprises. Um, but we've done this in Spain with just uh, data on investment uh, so that the techniques work um, even when you don't have the consumption data itself. Um, and what are the main findings? Uh, reassuringly, it's not like we always get the same thing back. For one thing, we don't get full risk sharing much. Sometimes we do. It will not surprise you when we get it, given that pa the other papers we've discovered in class. The big interesting thing is there's a difference between the rural data and the urban data. And the, uh, the rural data, fairly limited financial regimes, like savings only or limited borrowing, they fit the best um, when you use the investment and uh, and income data. Uh, but in the urban areas, even when you use the investment and income data, you get something less constraining like moral hazard. Um, so arguably the information problem or if, if you believe in missing markets, they're more missing in the rural areas than they are in the urban areas. Um, all right. So here's the model, utility over consumption and effort. Uh, output is stochastic. Instead of writing, you know, output is a function of effort and capital plus a shock. This is a more general histogram. You've seen it at least once before. Probability of any given output given effort and capital. Uh, Households are either on their own or entering into contracts with a financial intermediary. It's partial equilibrium facing some exogenous outside return. And uh, you can think about this uh, financial intermediaries as being competitive uh, if you want. You could also think about it as a stand-in for the community as a whole. Um, I'll show you where this stuff matters. Uh, and you're going to solve this contracting problem for many dates, even potentially over an infinite horizon. OK, and finally, how many people do we have? You could actually think about this as a risk-neutral household running a business sorry, risk-averse household running a business facing a risk-neutral intermediary as if there are only two people. But a lot of what we do is easier to interpret when there's a continuum, many, many, continuum of household enterprises, uh, because then we can talk about the fractions of households who took effort, had certain capital, and experienced a certain output. That actually eliminates uncertainty from the point of view of the intermediary, because all these things average out. Yes, Matt? Uh, can they recontract each period? Or what do you see? Uh, here, we're largely ruling it out. There is some limited commitment in the sense that they can walk away and go into autarky. That's about as close as we get in this paper. Uh, I. I kind of know something about how to extend it, but you're, it's not going to be in the lecture today. So how do you get, just, do you get like time variation in the simulated data, or is it, is it just kind of like a cross-section? Uh, it's like both a cross-section and panel. Okay. You use both aspects. The best way to think about you know, having multiple intermediaries is there's ex ante competition among them to serve as households, but there's something committing households once they sign up to a, a long-term agreement. Yeah. All right. 
So, okay, so what's the initial state for a household, say? Well, for sure, at least, the initial capital stock, you know, when we visit them in the baseline survey. And, uh, and then the second argument depends on the financial regime. If it's like borrowing and lending, then it's their, their current assets or their net indebtedness. Uh, or if it's one of these contract regimes, it's essentially some utility constraint, some reservation utility, as if it were, had been promised in the past. And I'll say more about that. That's the key to handling the dynamic incentive problem. Uh, clearly, something like unobserved utility is not seen, so we're going to have to parameterize it with a mean and a variance and estimate this unobserved distribution of debt or promises uh, in the population. Timing, okay, so those are initial states. Then capital uh, is used in production along with effort, which may or may not be observed depending on the regime. Output is realized. There's this pre-existing financial contract which determines you know, the debt, say, that they can take on or savings for tomorrow or transfers as an in insurance. And finally, after that financial stuff, they eat some and invest the rest. Okay, so it's kind of like a standard neoclassical setup. Capital today, you produce with labor, then you can either eat or invest. Uh, the fancy stuff is happening with the financial part, which, you know, is the difference between what you have available and, and what you either give up or get, depending on the financial contract. Capital depreciates, that's pretty standard, and of course then you go to the next prime, next period with all these prime variables on them. So that the transition from the state today to the state tomorrow with a financial contract in between. Okay. In particular, um, we're going to uh, talk about what goes on within the period in terms of the effort which is induced or assigned, the output which happens through Mother Nature the decision for capital tomorrow, and, and, and I'll go more into this promised utility for tomorrow. This pi thing is like the probability of this whole you know, quadruple. And it looks daunting. You, now, from a statistical point of view, it's like a histogram. You know, if you had a finite number of values for that Q, Z, K prime, and W prime can take on, then you just have a bunch of points in dimensional space. And, uh, and then you can talk about what mass, what height of a, of a bar, of a histogram bar, that, that those values take on. So statistically, it's an easy way to summarize the data. From the point of view of a financial contract, there's a lot of degeneracy. So it's not true, for example, typically that effort is random. You know, for a given set of parameter values, given incentives, there's one effort that's going to happen and, and none of the other happen. That's not inconsistent with this. It's just an extreme case where almost everything is zero except for one point of effort, and that's one. It's also true that, you know, there might be a functional relationship between consumption and output, maybe a nice smooth function, or if you want to grid it up, You've got you know, a series of dots that lie on a, on a, a line. So then you know, we talk about the probability of Q and C as if you know, it was a shotgun. But in practice, all the mass is going to lie on that line. So you're, you know, you're used to thinking about let C be a function of Q, let effort be assigned. You know, we'll take care of how much capital is invested, et cetera. Uh, Okay. It is true also that you know capital might be indivisible. 
We've talked about this. You get project ideas. You may or may not want to do it. The equipment is really chunky, you know, building that warehouse for the chickens. Uh, so that's actually more realistic. And then the probability is kind of serious, which is what is, what is the probability you're going to do it or what fraction of the population are going to do it. When we talk about fractions of the population, you should be reminded of Rogerson. There it was, you work overtime or you work or you don't work at all. And the issue was what fraction of people are working. So that was the first experience in this class where we had a probability number. And when we have non-convexities, this is the generalization of it to allow probabilities on more than, potentially on more than one thing. Um, and there's a reason, and I'll show you when we write it down, it turns everything into a linear programming problem. I'm going to talk about particular utility functions, particular production functions, but really we don't need to assume and that's both the strength and limitation of this. I'm not going to show you a lot of closed form analytic solutions. But on the other hand, we can solve anything numerically. Um, and Cynthia, again, just to alert you, you know, was backing out sort of from Euler equations with first order conditions, you know, which Lagrange multiplies, pliers are binding, and why, and so on. So it's not like you can't, you can in principle do both, actually. You don't necessarily have to buy. OK, so let's just think about a standard problem without the lotteries. This is the autarky problem. Household enterprise has uh, uh, a realized output Q, depreciated capital from last period. Actually, it's a QI. It's already realized. In autarky, there's nothing left other than deciding on what to eat and what to invest. So this is the capital stock for tomorrow. Oh, sorry. And then there's this effort Z. Z is entering in disutility. It's also entering in this production function. You want expected utility? Fine. Just sum up over all possible outputs, taking into account Mother Nature's way of determining stochastically what those outputs are. And whatever you decide to take over to tomorrow enters in the value function tomorrow, OK? So we're looking for this infinite horizon solution. We're looking for a value function v that's like a fixed point that solves the functional equation like this. Um, now again, when QI is realized, you still have to decide on investment. That's why I is on both k prime and q. Uh, but z is determined before uh, output is realized. So that's just one number. You with me? OK. Looks, this is an equivalent problem. And you know this looks familiar, except the i's are missing. So it's output you know, plus depreciated capital, less investment for tomorrow deciding on effort. But now we've taken this deterministic looking problem and just replaced it with this, with this probability object. But it allows all these special cases. Anything that can solve this solves this subject to, to grids, subject to approximating you know, with a finite number of outputs, et cetera. All right. Now, if it looks here as if the choice object is this probability number, uh, including the probability of output, but how can that be? Because Mother Nature plays a role. So we kind of have to constrain these histograms to respect the relationship between, between k, z, and q, and, and mainly this object. We don't want to lose this object, you know? Well, this is a fancy way of just saying the probability of event A conditioned on event B times the probability of event B is the same thing as a joint event 
you know, a comma b. So this was the probability of q bar and z bar, because I summed over everything else. This is the probability of q bar given z bar, and then this is summing over everything else, the probability of z bar. So it's a cute trick. So we're not going to sort of cheat on Mother Nature. We're constrained to follow Mother Nature. Uh, another thing to say, uh, what's the dimensionality? Well, the, the state variable is k. So the question is, how many little k's are there? If we grid up k in the small, medium, and large, there's three of them, for example. There could be 10. That's our choice in terms of the grid. But what, you know, whatever it is, we've got to solve this functional equation v and find the fixed point by iterating. Okay. And the larger is the dimension of this, you know, the harder it is to do that. Jan. So can you can you say something more about why the two formulations are equivalent? In the second case, I think uh, the agents can do some randomization and choose. Yeah, yeah, I should have. But when in the first case, uh, yeah, if. If we don't get the grid right, for example, if we have a continuum of values of z and so on, you know, and then we have to make sure that the solution here is on a grid point down here. Or to put it the other way around, if, there's, um, if the grid is serious, you know, then, then the household may want to optimize in terms of choosing a probability. And in that case, this is not just going to replicate. This allows more. Yeah. So if, if it wants to, we can find this solution, but it may choose to find something, something else. There, there are grid lotteries, but it's easy to detect them in the output. You've got like, you know, medium effort and high effort, and then, you know, the thing is like putting probability on both of those. They're, they're like adjacent points. So it's clear where the program's trying to get something in the middle that's just not available. And if the grid is serious, then as in Rogerson, that's fine. If we think the grid ought to be not there and it's just meant to be an approximation, then you probably want to slice and dice it a bit more. And, Search more intensively between those adjacent points. But uh, so in the second column, uh, is it possible that the solution uh, requires a ra random contract? It is possible, yes. But, but in reality, why the agent can randomly choose a contract? So I think in the first formulation, the agent cannot choose a random contract. But in the second one, you can choose. Yeah, yeah, I agree with your point. Well, you think it's infeasible to randomize? Uh, so I think if, you, if your assumption is that in reality the agent can, can do randomization, then I agree that these two formulations are equivalent. But if you, if you don't assume that... I am assuming they can do the randomization. Okay. And, and again, as in Rogerson, it's a way to smooth out the non-convexities. That's the main, you know, we've turned non-convex problems into a linear program. Oh, why is it a linear programming problem? Well, these pies are the choice variables. So, you know, it's tempting to say, oh, no, it's supposed to be k and z. No, 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 no. It's the probability of q and z. So this is just a number, this utility, if you were to do a, a certain quadruple. And this is the probability of that quadruple. So. So these are the fundamental sort of policy variables. And what is the dimensionality of them? Number Q cross number Z cross number K prime. You know, so th this can get pretty big pretty fast. Um, but, and how many constraints there are? Well, in this case, just the one. Although, you know, probabilities do have to add up. But essentially, one constraint. Well, not quite. It's for every Q bar and Z bar. So actually, there's number Q cross number Z constraints here. 
I'm not going to belabor this, but when you go through the other regimes, you're going to keep an eye on sort of how many constraints there are and so on. And uh, eventually, we'll get to regimes that are actually nice and challenging to compute. Here's the. Um, I just kind of don't understand exactly what you mean when you say that the pi's are the choice variables, and the q and the k's and the z's are just numbers. I mean, they sh they still ought to be consistent. So when you choose a pi, then you're doing. Yeah. Suppose you suppose you had a continuous consumption schedule. Mm -hmm. So the c is a function of q, and then you know the paradigm is either you work hard or you you work very little. So there's just two, right? So for any, if you choose not to work hard, that's going to be reflected in output, but you're still facing that consumption schedule. Mm -hmm. Or you could work hard, or potentially you randomize across working hard or not. So the randomization could be in the effort. So the tries are functions. I'm choosing a function. Mm -hmm. I'm choosing a function. Actually, here, it's so general that you don't see any functions. You're just choosing mass points over a finite number of q's, z's, and k primes without, without constraints. I am quote-unquote choosing a function. Like, yeah. Is it more like choosing a distribution, though? You're sort of saying... If I'm these were, that. yeah, if these were a continuum, then this would be like a density, a multidimensional density. But I don't know how to compute those. Mm -hmm. It's not, so correct me if I'm wrong, but it's not that then I can put anything next to it. I have to put, plug in to the yeah. U next to it, the corresponding stuff in there. But then I just compute every single thing inside there, choose the best That's one right. after I compute everything. That's right. So, you know, we specify the grids. So we know the set of feasible choices for, for all the quadruples, Q, Z, K prime. For, for any particular one, we know what this real number is. You use MATLAB code to generate these weights, right? In this case, it's a weight on, a, on the objective function, or use codes to generate you know, this guy, and then there's weights on the constraint set. So, okay, so now I understand that. But then, in some sense, I don't understand what the difference from the, the first case from the first step problem. Um, that the probability of Q given K and Z can, could, in principle, be nonlinear, and so we're just okay. It's the extra gain from randomization. I mean, suppose um, Take the point of view that there are a continuum of, well, so far we don't have the social planner. I mean, this is just an individual optimization. But I will try to answer your question. You know, when we have a, a village-wide resource constraint, we've got to decide how many resources to use up in investment and how much to leave over for consumption. And it may be that you don't want everyone doing the large, chunky project. You want to just take some people to do it and some people not. And then, you know, whatever is produced as output, use that, some of that for consumption and some to save for tomorrow. So from sort of a social perspective, you rarely want everyone doing the same thing. You want to choose the fractions of people doing one thing or the other. Does that help? All right. All right. So. So this is with borrowing and lending, so it's essentially almost the same, except you can add to your current resources by borrowing, except you've got to pay back your loan from yesterday. So now you've got two ways to intertemporally reallocate consumption, one through uh, the capital stock, the equipment, and the other through financial borrowing and lending. And it's already written in lotteries. By the way, it enhances the state vector, right, from the capital stock to the current debt as well.
Uh, now we can, we can knock off like, you know, savings only. That's where basically if B means borrowing, you know, then, then, uh, <coughs> you know, then, then basically it can't be positive if you're not going to allow it. Uh, or you could allow some small amount and have a, a positive but low amount that you could borrow as B max. Okay, so that we can do savings only, et cetera. If you don't want to limit borrowing at all, that's fine. Then, you know, you just let it take on any value subject to grid issues. Yep. When, when you do this kind of stuff in MATLAB, to do these different scenarios, is that just then like go through one line of code? Which? Like to, you know, to have uh, oh, that no borrow, only savings. Yeah, well, actually, you can almost generate it from the grid because, you know, you, you might have a, a large set of possible values for borrowing. Well, that would be the unrestricted problem. If you want savings only, then you just cut off all the positive borrowings or anything in between. So, that, so this one you can handle in terms of generating the underlying grid. Now we get to these mechanism design models. Well, including full information. Uh, and now we're going to have to go back to the households as a group dealing with this financial intermediary. Um, the main thing is this <coughs> let's look at the household, because we were looking at households a minute ago. You know, now it, it's as if they surrendered all their output to the bank, bear with me, but they get some of it back in terms of transfers. Actually, a more way, a natural way to write it would have been, you know, give them Q and let them pay back loans, state contingent loans, it's equivalent. Uh, the transfer can be positive or negative. Uh, and it's kind of the basis of consumption, but it's adjusted as usual by investment. So then the contract has to solve for these transfers, and the transfers are a function of Q. Now, as I said, the way this is written, the Q ends up with the bank, but the bank is paying the transfers. So this, this is basically a surplus generated from households. What fraction of households have output Q greater than tau, so the bank is getting money from them? Well, that's this pi. That's the fraction. Oh, well, you know, it's infinite horizon, so this is the surplus generated today, or if negative, the loss, summed up over all surpluses and losses, depending on who's at you know, what states and what the contract assigns. And then you have tomorrow's profits. This is a small open economy. There's a interest rate R, one, one plus little r. So this is just the present value of tomorrow, right? So this surplus today plus profits today plus profits tomorrow. So it's as if the bank is trying to maximize overall profits. Uh, now, what's the constraint? Why not just screw the households? Well, the answer is, it's not quite right, but you can think about this as a reservation utility. All right, so you can't take too much away, otherwise the households will cry foul and, and walk away. Okay? Actually, technically, this promise was predetermined from the previous period. Or, you know, equivalently, part of the control variable is the promise from tomorrow on, W prime. It's easy and yet amazingly powerful. So just think about incentives. You know, you have long-term contracts. Should I work today? I can get rewarded or penalized depending on what my output is today. But it's not just a static contract. There's tomorrow too. So maybe my history of observed outputs will be used tomorrow in terms of the insurance and credit contract I'm going to get, which in turn could be used in the third period. And we're like, oh my god, you know, that's a really big object. 
But no, what do the households care about? They only care about their expected utility. If I'm looking forward to tomorrow, I don't have to solve tomorrow's problem as long as I know what the utility consequences will be. So this is kind of a reduced form way of handling the multi-period incentive problem. What I'm saying is the household's expected utility is the utility outcome from today plus expected utility tomorrow. You know, it's not only, it's the probability of being assigned W prime tomorrow jointly with output today. So now, not only is consumption moving up and down with output today, as, and it will move when there's limited insurance, but also tomorrow's utility will vary up and down. And because you have you know, concave utility and this sort of force for intertemporal smoothing, you won't just do one and you won't just do the other. Actually, you'll load as much into the future as possible. Front loading is a bad thing. The, the longer the horizon, the more powerful the incentives because you've got the whole future. So, so there's a lot of economics behind this sort of innocuous looking two period problem where W prime captures tomorrow. All right. That's actually the full insurance problem. And then we can add moral hazard. So, you know, basically what this says is if Z bar is assigned today uh, in the contract and the guy actually does it, he has to be wanting to do it relative to, uh, and, the, and the bank wouldn't know, uh, even though Z bar is being recommended, the guy's doing Z hat, shirking. So this is a standard moral hazard constraint. Of course, the, the inequality makes them want to do the recommendation. But the program has to evaluate any possible deviation a shirking agent might, might do and make sure the utility consequences for the agent are worse than following the recommended plan. Now again, because we've embedded mother nature in this pi thing, we have to renormalize the probability. I actually showed you this once, but you know, I'm sure with discounting you can't remember backwards. More on that next Tuesday. Uh, but we have you just adjust the likelihood to reflect the fact that now Z hat is taken rather than Z bar. And it's not maybe obvious where this is coming from. It is nevertheless true. You just have to write out all the conditional probabilities and start start summing up. I can give you a reference if you want to see where it's written out. Questions? Yes? I just want to make sure that I understand this formulation. But I think the advantage of this formulation is that if you don't have this formulation, first of all, you need to solve uh, the incentive compatible contracts uh, one by one. And in this case, uh, so randomizing contract is like randomizing your wells. So you only need to solve one, one problem. You just, so I suppose you randomize. Well, actually, you're suggesting a simplification that we're not using, which is any random, oh, you mean the W, the promise. Yeah, I think, I think the advantage of the second formulation compared to the first one is that in the first one, you need to solve, first solve all the incentive compatible contracts. And then you, you do an optimal randomization among these contracts. But, in, but here you can just, X and T, you can random, randomize over uh, this Z and K, and uh, that will give you the similar result. So essentially, you only need to solve one linear programming problems instead of a lot. Is that, is that well, I guess we're, we're searching jointly over all the possibilities. Uh, now, you know, it's true on the one hand, it's just a linear programming problem. So we can just get the best code available and use it. On the other hand, you know, there's lots of variables, lots of states, lots of constraints. So it's not like it comes for free. If, if, I, if I knew something analytically about the underlying contract, it would be good to use it. 
Um, but if I don't know, then I could just guess wrong and put some functional form which is incorrect. And you know, that's why that's what's good about this. I don't. Now, what was Victor talking about? You know, Victor was talking about going back to deterministic contracts and then solving them with a nonlinear optimization problem and then comparing that solution to these linear codes. Um, and I'm, I'm not sure if he showed you at the end, but you know, when the grids are really coarse, the linear program seems to work, but it can be a really bad approximation. So, so there's still trade-offs. It's not, it's not you know, a miracle. Um, other questions? All right, so now we can do limited commitment. So this is what I mentioned. You can go, you can go into autarky. Because you can decide to do that after your output is realized. It's like, I'm not paying into the risk sharing group. Great, you finance my project. I'm a big, the big boss now, you know, and I just assume be on my own. So what we say is, uh, First of all, we compute the value function for autarky. Well, that's cool. We already did that. That was the first financial regime. So we already know this guy. And then the contemporary situation is you've got output plus depreciated capital. And, uh, and then you could walk away. No transfers. They're gone. Right? You just keep it all and decide maybe what you want to carry into tomorrow. So we can call the solution to this thing, omega, you know, by the way, the, the z is already foregone. You've already made that decision. It was in the disutility part. Um, you already got capital. You already got funding. You are, now you have output. Can't go backwards, but you can walk away. So this is the, basically the, the maximizing utility, and we make sure that if you follow the plan, you're not going to be tempted to do that. Okay, so we compute V, then compute this, then we have this, and then you impose this as a constraint. So this is a limited commitment constraint. We've talked about collateral constraints. It's very related to that. You can walk away, but you might, you know, with collateral, you have to sacrifice something. Not here. They actually keep all of their capital. Uh, if we had financial savings, then they would lose that. They would lose the stuff they have in the bank. So what keeps me from doing that is that the continued valuation is kind of in that side. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is, this is playing yeah. ball. And this is being tempted to, to pull out. Now, it doesn't mean that it isn't binding on the solution. This can do damage. You know, it could be a binding constraint and have a big Lagrange multiplier. So the, the solution will look different. Uh, but you never see the out of equilibrium event that they walk away. But, but the damage can be done. Not getting a whole lot of capital, not having a whole lot of insurance, those things happen. I mean, again, it's rich guys who would prefer, say, not to pay into the system. You know, they're going to be tempted. So you start eliminating the people that pay in, and that starts limiting the insurance, et cetera, et cetera. And then finally, uh, we have this hidden output. So here the idea is income is produced all right, but the outsiders don't see what it is. Uh, OK, but then you say, well, tell me anyway. Send me a message. So, so the idea here is Q is actually realized, Q bar is actually realized, and, and, that, and the business says so. You know, believe me, my profits are low. Or, Q, and they are low, or Q bar is realized, uh, but we have this counterfactual where he says something else about Q, like, Maybe in that particular period, it was advantageous to say profits are really, really high. Or it could be, you know, vice versa. 
when they're high, you say hi. When they're low, you're tempted. Sorry, when they're low, you say low. And when they're high, you're tempted to say low. All right. This allows for any cue, though, that they will, quote, tell the truth. Well, great. It's just another inequality. No problemo. We know how to generate constraints. But again, it will do different damage. There's going to be consequences for, uh, for the underlying contract. And remember, the goal here is to get to the data. You can assume these parametric utility functions, constant relative risk aversion, power sigma, disutility of effort, a power of Frisch elasticity. OK? So three, you know, we're going to be limited, actually. We're going to estimate sigma and theta, and x at xc equal 1. Here's a production function. We actually load in an observed histogram. But you can do constant elasticity of substitution if you want. Yep? So you use Heflin where you can verify the state. That's not like output is hidden, right? Yeah, I didn't do it. Why not? <laughs> yeah, I forgot about costly state verification. But anyway, <clears throat> it's doable. Oh. Hong's working on it. Uh, and these other things like the discount rate, you know, the depreciation rate, the outside interest rate, and so on. So this is very much in the spirit of calibration. These numbers are similar to numbers you've seen in various papers in the classes, trying to be somewhat realistic. Yep? When we're back to, you say, living in the matrix P of Q given C and K, is that just for uh, like setting up the moral hazard constraint, or does that do you also No, we need that in general. There, so, so we're going to say that we see effort, even though in the models sometimes it's unobserved. I mean, the question is what an outside lender would see, not what the households tell us when we interview them. So anyway, we take the stand that we see a good version of it in the, and capital as well, and we see output. And I think that, all right, let's see where that is. Oh my God, it's way, there it was. So there's an, an empirical histogram of capital, labor, and output. I don't know if you get, if you really get a three-dimensional view of that thing. I can kind of see it's bending over here and then what I'll let it flip on me. But, so we can load that in or we can actually say, no, 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 it's CES. You know, some elasticity of substitution and estimate, you know, whether it's Leontia for linear or stuff in between. Yep. On, like, on graphs like this, is, that, is there a way to understand whether the thing is concave or convex? Like, whether those, you know. Yeah, but it's kind of hard <laughs> I, because I don't know what this thing is doing. It, it doesn't look like visually like it kept going down. It may, it may actually come back. By the way, it makes my point, we don't have to assume any kind of concavity in the underlying primitives. You know, if it has this sort of scallop shape, wonderful. Bring on the lotteries. Then it will, it will span the arc line. We can even allow risk-loving households here. I mean, there, there's really no restriction in the underlying primitives. We have parameterized utilities, you know, to make people risk averse, but in principle, we don't have to put restrictions on what we load in. Okay, so preferences, technology. I'll just say a few words about dimensionality as we go through autarky, savings, full information, moral hazard, etc. You can start counting the number of linear programs that need to be solved the number of variables in each program, the numbers of constraints. I didn't even dare show you this unobserved investment one, but the hidden output's getting up there too. We actually have a technology to, to compute these things with hundreds of thousands of constraints. I mean, the commercial code is CPLEX, and there's you know, open freeware that's comparable to it. It's the latest Princeton, you know, interior point. It's not just a simplex algorithm. Uh, you can use it as a student, actually. 
Uh, it cost me a couple thousand dollars, but uh, anyway, so we can handle fairly large numbers. Now, it's, it's a, that said, you know, what's the tension here? Well, you're going to see, not only do you have to iterate off the value functions and solve the linear program at each iteration, and, you know, and solve, a, this is just one step, right? But then we don't even know what the parameters are. So then we got to do it for all the set of possible parameters and generate a likelihood. So, so these guys start to get demanding, not because you can't solve it once in 20 or 30 seconds, but because you've got to do it you know, hundreds and hundreds of times. So you can understand why there's a big interest in having relatively efficient code. You know, it starts to constrain you in terms of the, the kinds of problems you, you really want to consider. All right. So, so how does it work computationally? Well, once you solve for the optimizing policy, pi star, you have a transition function. Basically, you start with promised utility and capital today integrate out over everything else other than capital and utility tomorrow, and, and you get the probability of that. So you get this Markov object, right? It's simple enough conceptually. The probability of states tomorrow given states today. So that, that's kind of the underlying dynamic engine that's chugging along for each one of these financial regimes. And then any time you pick up a certain W and K in the solution, you can generate the contract because that's the stuff that we just integrated out, but it's still there. You can still use it. So we can generate histograms, you know, CQ configurations. We can have two cross sections. We can have panel. There are some limits in terms of the length of the panel that we can actually use. You still with me? Uh, we got to estimate some parameters, so we're going to have uh, these underlying structural parameters. Uh, we don't see, say, the distribution of promised utilities, so we're going to imagine that's generated maybe like a normal distribution with a certain mean and a certain variance. We have to estimate those. Better yet would be a mixture of normals, which can approximate any old thing you want, but that raises the dimensions. And we're trying to be lean in terms of numbers of parameters. Now, so what do I mean by likelihood? The probability of getting observables y, you know, which could be like in a static cross-section, values of consumption, output, investment, and capital. What's the probability of seeing a particular configuration like that given the observed capital today as a function of these underlying parameter values? So because the model is already using lotteries, you already get the probability of these objects. It just sort of comes for free as part of the optimizing solution. Now, you know, the next thing is, do we see things perfectly? No, not necessarily. We can put in, let me jump a second. We can put in measurement error and say, you know, you know, if C star at J were the true value, we don't see it. We see some measured version with error. So this is classic econometric contamination, classical measurement error. We can, we can put that on everything uh, that you like. And then, you know, you know, the program would say, what, what is the probability the underlying, you know, output and consumption would be C star and Q star that we generate from the code. And then we can say, well, what we see is C hat and Q hat. So, you know, that could come from any C star and Q star. So you get a new sort of distribution of observables. Well, that's what I just said in words. Um, Uh, 
well, you know, what's the point of the likelihood? We actually have the data and we see people with a certain capital stock getting a certain output and having a certain consumption, investing a certain amount. These are our observables. And so we see the histograms in the data. And now we have a histogram in the model. So we can say, does it, what parameters would best rationalize the data if the data came from that financial regime, a particular one? So let me you know, so I said we have these data. This is Kansas and the Rocky Mountains for Thailand, a mixed metaphor. Uh, but it's also the investment. Uh, you know, consumption is again pretty flat, so it's you know it, it's going to suggest a regime where there's a lot of consumption smoothing against income fluctuations. On the other hand, you know investment isn't flat, and I haven't even shown you the transitions in the capital stock. So when you uh, you know you pick the rural data. Uh, and you use, uh, say, you know, say, choose uh, consumption and output only. Uh, there's a tie. You know, if you believed it was the moral hazard regime, for example, it's estimating the degree of risk aversion at 1.02, the Frisch elasticity at 1.6. It's got a certain mean and variance of this underlying unseen distribution of promised utilities and an estimate of the measurement error. And it does this for each financial regime against the same data. And then we use this sort of information criterion, which you know Vong created, which allows testing across non-nested regimes. In this case, it's a tie. Um, but if you went to the, the investment data alone, it would be savings, savings only. So in the rural data, we, we get a sort of a limited uh, regime. I, I, probably, I won't have time to show you the Monte Carlos. The Monte Carlos are like this. You, know, you pick a set of parameter values, maybe the ones we estimate in the data, for example. And, uh, and then generate the data from the model, and then go through all of this. And you know, depending on the degree of measurement area, the area, area, error that you use to contaminate the data, you know, you can, especially when you use joint consumption and investment data, you pretty much get back what you put in, which is reassuring. But it's a bit black boxy. We don't have an, an analytic proof. Uh, so, you know, if you use consumption data long, alone, two cross sections, you can use uh, two year panels, you know, then there's, in the rural data, it's kind of hard to pin down too much. In terms of the regime, moral hazard is in there, sometimes full information is in there, limited commitment is in there. But again, when you use uh, the investment data alone or use the joint data, it's pretty clear that savings only, no borrowing, buffer stock model is the one that the data like the best. Uh, but when we, you know, if we use the network alone, you're saying, well, you contradicted, no, like what Cynthia and I do and so on, we can actually get the full information regime out of the consumption data. So that's kind of very reassuring because in those other papers, we didn't use this method. But there's a lot of consmoothing, consumption smoothing among the networks. Uh, and if we go to the urban data, we get this result that uh, even when we use the investment data, it's the moral hazard regime, not the limited savings only regime. So they're, they're different across the two specifications. Although it is true that if you used 
the investment date alone, it would still like savings. Uh, so, you know, the, there's still this, and we've talked about this, money doesn't flow from unproductive to productive people the way these relatively unconstrained regimes you know, would imply. However, if you looked at the consumption data jointly, then you know, it's one likelihood and it decides in the urban area that, oh, well, moral hazard actually fits better than savings only, but the reverse is true in the, in the rural data. So although the investment data doesn't fit perfectly well, in the urban data, it, the, the verdict is uh, we do a ton of robustness checks, and I'll skip it. Uh, so let me just, I really want to say something about heterogeneity, but what I'd rather show you three slides before I quit. Namely, in the actual rural data, this, this sort of diagonal here represents the persistence of the capital stock. So it doesn't move much. It moves very slowly. You can hardly see mass off the diagonal. In the urban data, it's still sluggish, but at least you can move away more. Now, you know, if you have this wonderful financial regime, you're going to adjust almost instantaneously to the observed productivity. So this speed of adjustment of the capital stock is really the thing that's kind of pushing the likelihoods toward limited financial regimes. By the way, these are the best fitting regimes through the lens of the model, which still have, you know, an excessive amount of smoothing. Um, these are the time series, levels of consumption over time, le levels of the capital stock, levels of income. We did not use all of this data. This is like setting aside certain things in the data and then looking after the fact as a new criterion. And we're doing pretty well. The, the standard deviations we do less well but for obvious reasons that there are some stuff in the tails that just the model doesn't like. But if we sort of smooth off, you know, 1% of the tails and kind of get rid of it, we actually bring the standard deviations generated by the model much, much closer uh, to, the, to the data. And uh, we can actually use the, the level on borrowing, which we didn't use in estimate, and got really, really close to that. Uh, and, and finally, here's this data on the return on assets, you know, with these low wealth households having high returns. And uh, this, the savings only regime, which fits best, is kind of trying to do that. And this is the urban data, which is already a little more dispersed, but it still has this low wealth, high return guys, and, and it, it can generate that with somewhat with this moral hazard. So these are the familiar objects that we've been looking at. Uh, and finally, let me just end with this. Sorry, I guess that discussion at the beginning of class took, took a chunk of time. So if you believe the structural model, you can do policy evaluation. And here we're doing something simple like just changing the interest rate. Now the point is, some people win and some people lose. And also, who are the winners and the losers depends on the financial regime. You know, so this is the consumption equivalent welfare gain of, of uh, lowering the interest rate, you know, negative and positive. This is sort of look as we vary the level of current savings and the level of assets. But this is what it would look like if it were not the savings regime, but the borrowing regime at the estimated parameters we get. And then this is the difference of those two. So it's another difference in difference, but it's, it's a difference in the welfare criteria across two financial regimes. 
And the point is, it matters quite a lot if you did this interest rate subsidy, what the financial regime is in terms of who wins and who loses. These are, these are non-trivial gains and so on. All right, I'll quit there. <laughs>